Hello, everyone. I wanted to tell you about two trips we're sponsoring this year. Uh, part of our Geo Tours uh, portion of the Skeptic Society is our social and science uh, explorations. The first one is June 2nd through 16th, so 14 days, two weeks from Ireland to Iceland on a cruise ship with none other than Richard Dawkins. This is the passage from Ireland to Iceland, we're calling it. And Richard Dawkins will be the uh, invited guest and lecturer where you can hang out with him for two weeks. As on this ship, the Vega, it has a guest of 152 um, plate people that can join. So it's not a big, huge cruise ship with thousands of people. So you get to intimate time with, with Richard. Uh, it starts in Dublin and goes to Reykjavik as we explore Europe's northernmost islands, Scotland's Hebrides, Orkneys, and Shetlands, Denmark's Faroes Islands, and Iceland. A remote world known for its rugged landscape, picturesque villages, fascinating history, and nature lovers' uh, delights. The second trip is from Greenland to uh, Canada's Nova Scotia. We're calling this Wonders of the Arctic on the same ship, just a 152-person ship called the Vega. It's a beautiful ship. Our featured guest for that trip, which is September 23rd through October 10th, uh, is Jared Diamond. Yes, Jared. So we have Richard Dawkins and Jared Diamond, two of the biggest names of our generation, two of the greatest minds, both good friends. Just picture just sitting on a ship, just hanging out with these guys. So, of course, they're lecturing, but breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they're just sitting around and you can sit there and chat with two of the greatest minds of our time. Uh, this second trip, September 23rd through October 10th, uh, goes from Greenland to Nova Scotia with a bunch of different stops in between. So check it out. Uh, go to skeptic.com slash geology underscore tours, or just go to our website, skeptic.com. You'll see it prominently on the homepage there. Again, skeptic.com slash geology underscore tours to get access to those and sign up. Uh, these are big, fun trips. I mean, I've done a bunch of these myself, and uh, it, it's just great to be able to spend so much time with such great minds of our generation. All right. Thanks for listening. Here's our podcast. Nice to, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Let me give a proper introduction to the new book here, We Are Agora. There it is. I have the advanced reader's uh, edition. It's How Humanity Functions as a Single Superorganism that shapes our world and our future. Byron, I've received, I don't know, I was just thinking about it today, maybe a thousand books the last five years or so. I get maybe two a day uh, wow. here in the office. And yours, the only one that came with uh, goodies, a swag. I got a 50,000-year-old social insect embedded in amber. And I got some 10,000-year-old ivory tusk. I presume that's real. <laughs> yeah, but mammoth, <laughs> mammoth ivory. Mam mammoth ivory, yes, 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 mammoth yes. ivory. Yeah, not 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 elephant ivory. And I got a, a gold pocket watch from the 16th century. Hopefully this is a replica. You didn't send me a 200000 year dollar value watch. Anyway, w what's the significance of these uh, objects for your book and your oh, thesis? Oh, well, thank you for uh, for asking. Nobody has, has, has ever done that before. So uh, the Agora book is about uh, whether... Let me start at the beginning, if that's okay. Yeah, please. I um, I grew up on a farm, and uh, I, I was a Boy Scout. <clears throat> and every summer, I'd go to summer camp. And I was a nerdy Boy Scout. And when I would go to summer camp, the merit badges that they offered were all like woodcraft. But one year, I went there, and there was a nerdy merit badge being offered. It was bookkeeping. And I was like, that's what I want to spend my summer doing. I want to learn accounting. So I signed up for the bookkeeping merit badge uh, with eight other Boy Scouts. And when we got there that day, uh, this old grizzled man came out and said there was no such thing as a bookkeeping merit badge, that we had all signed up for beekeeping. Yeah. That is a true story about how I became a beekeeper. And I fell in love with bees. And what I learned uh, as I had my bees and studied their lore is that, you know, bees are individual creatures, animals, and they're made of cells, which are individually alive. But what I learned is that the bees themselves come together and form uh, what is called a superorganism. It is not a metaphor. The, the beehive is actually an animal. It, it has different properties than any bee has. It, for instance, bees are cold-blooded. 
but the beehive holds its body temperature to 97 degrees. It has a memory. It lives 100 years, whereas a bee only lives a few weeks. So it's actually an animal. And what I wondered is if the same was true for people. Are people are made of cells, and all those cells are alive, and they come together to form us. Is it possible that people individually are cells in a larger organism? Not a metaphor, again, but just a simple biological fact. Is there an animal that we are cells in? And that is the thesis of the book. I, I didn't know when I started writing it where I would land, uh, but I, I now believe there is such a creature. And I named it Agora, after the uh, noisy marketplaces of ancient Greece. So all of the items that you pointed at illustrate some aspect of that. The social insect, uh, the termite, embedded in amber, is one of the social insects. And, and how they came to be cells in a larger creature is covered in the book. The watch is uh, an emergent thing. In other words, there's no gear in that watch that can tell time, but all of the gears together keep time. It's an emergent property, like the emergent properties of a beehive. And finally, the mammoth ivory. The mammoth ivory illustrates how humans got the ability to take down a mammoth 10,000 years ago, something no individual human could do. That that was kind of the, 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 the beginnings of us being able to operate as a superorganism. Now, the last thing I'll say on this is, I actually do believe this is an animal, a real creature, um, and I, I consider that a scientifically testable hypothesis. It, it, at first glance, may not seem like one, because your cells don't know you exist. They, they don't have any way to perceive you. You live on a different scale than they do. When you cut your finger and the platelets run off to clot the blood, they, they, the clot, the cut, they, don't, they don't think, okay, well, let's go help Michael out to cut his finger. They just live their lives oblivious to you. And so it would be difficult to, to prove that we are part of, literally part of an animal uh, that lives on a different time scale than we do. Uh, but I, as I thought about it, I, I found, a, I created a number of testable hypotheses that would be true if... We are, in fact, part of a creature, and that's what the book is. Yeah, nice summary. Uh, uh, I'm with you on the metaphor part. Is it actually an animal? I guess it depends on how you define an animal. Uh, a termite mound, the individual termites have no idea th that this is what they're building, the equivalent of like a skyscraper. But individual people who build skyscrapers, they know that's what they're doing. They have an architectural plan, and they're organized, they communicate. And they have a goal that they're conscious, uh, uh, consciously aware of. That's what they're doing. The termites, it's programmed. It seems different. Social insects, you know, are genetically uh, different from us um, in terms of how similar they are versus how diverse we are, or uh, anything but the social insects, for example. Um, so I'm not sure how far to go with well, that metaphor. Now I'm I'm willing to engage it all the way because. <laughs> Would you first of all grant that you are comp you you are comprised of living creatures, yes. uh, of cells, and they come together to form you. Yeah, and you are definitely, I assume, you believe a different animal than the cells, but you are not a cell. Uh, you don't share your body with the cells. The, the 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 there's an organizational pattern that exists one level up from from the cells that is you. I liken that to uh, one of those posters. Uh, maybe you've seen these. It's, it's a poster of maybe a puppy. And you look at it, and but then when you squint and look really closely, you see that it's made up of lots of little puppy photos that form the big puppy. So do you start by granting that you are an emerge, that you are a super organism? Yeah, so I guess it depends again how we're defining these things. What do you... So go ahead and give well, us your you, definition. Are you alive? Of, are are yeah, you so alive? Let's about, or, let, yeah, let's start there. What is what uh, does it mean to be alive? Is a virus alive, for example, versus uh -huh. an so, atom or a molecule yeah. versus a single There's cell? There's a lot in the book about yeah. that. Yeah, go so ahead. Let's by, start biology, there. Biology, 
is the study of life, and it must really vex biologists that we don't have a consensus definition of what life is. Uh, we only can talk about attributes of living things. And so we build lists and we say, if something exhibits these properties, we call it alive. But we don't actually know what life is. Um, what that indicates to me is that we're just not advanced enough. Uh, one of the quotes in the book was a, was a scientist saying, it's like trying to describe what water is without molecular theory. You just can't actually get to it. So there's something I think conceptually we don't yet know. But if you start with, well, let's just make lists of what living things are, uh, then uh, you can make a big exhaustive one of those. Well, this is a little bit, yeah, this is a little bit like Wittgenstein's analysis of language and concepts. You know, what is a dog? You know, do, you know is a wolf a dog? You know, is a, ch a chihuahua and a Great Dane really the same thing? You know, well, technically, yes, they are. You know, so again, is a virus a living thing? It depends on how you define it. We may not have but a com complete consensus starting, on the definition. Yeah. What what's the list? It's a little but bit like it's a little bit like diagnostic criteria. What is a mm -hmm. schizophrenic? You know, if you uh, or what is a psychopath? If you have twenty of the twenty seven items mm -hmm. on the list, then you are. But that's somewhat arbitrary, but not completely. However, I tried to phrase it as a as an answerable question, just from an intuition standpoint. Are you alive, or or not? It, maybe you're not. Maybe your cells are alive. They are primary life. They are not compri composed of living things. They are inorganic matter that comes together uh, is alive. But on um, but what basis do you say you are alive? I assume you believe you are alive. Yes, I, I'm. I'm an emergent properties okay. person. I, I accept that. Um, I think I am also a self. I think there is such a thing as a self. Mm -hmm. There are people, as you know, who deny that even, uh, or even free will and, and sentience, consciousness and all that. You know, I think all that exists, even if we can't perfectly define it. Um, again, in this Wittgensteinian sense that, you know, I know it when I see it. Uh, right. And most of us agree that, you know, life involves the consumption of energy, processing of energy, reproduction, you know, survival mm -hmm. and flourishing and, and so on. Something along those lines. Um, so the termites are alive. They're living organisms. Is the termite mound, which is made of dirt and clay or whatever it's made out of with a beehive, uh, you know, is it, it itself alive? I don't know about that. Well, it doesn't reproduce. No, it does. Uh, beehives reproduce. Every year, every spring, they split and they go off and make a second beehive. And but the, bees, do the, same but the thing. bees do that. The hive itself, by without the bees, doesn't do anything. Well, that's like saying a human baby isn't, that's just a bunch of cells. Um, they would, a, a people reproduce by producing another uh, emerging creature, and, and the beehives do the same. But I'll address your question very directly. So I agree with you that, you know, when bees do reproduce, when they swarm, it's really complicated because the beehive has to find a, a second home, a new home for half the hive. And the number of criteria are innumerable and, you know, about, uh, the, the, the space of the hole and protection from rain and uh, proximity to other bees, proximity to ants, storage, but all these things go into it. And individual bees, they go off and they scout locations and they come back and they dance this dance, but they think they have a good one. And then other bees join in and they go investigate. And then there's a, a consensus of about 30%. And then some bees start flying through to point the direction of the new one. And then some fly over there and spread a bunch of pheromones around so the queen can find it. And you're right. They don't know what they are doing. They don't know. Isn't that fascinating? We know this because uh, not only is their brain the si half the size of a grain of salt, none of the bees have ever done this before. They're only a few weeks old. And, and so they exhibit this incredibly intelligent behavior without understanding what they're doing. Now, um, I would say that is what people do. I would say, and the, one example I use in the book is uh, Manhattan. And because, you know, it's self-contained, it's kind of an island, a limited number of, so there's uh, 10,000 tons of food are brought into Manhattan every day because there's 40,000 restaurants and they have to make all the bagels and they have to make the pizza. And somehow they get it really close, um, even though there's all these variables back there, like the, the cod harvest from Chesapeake Bay yesterday and all this stuff goes into it. And so you say, how is it that the right amount of stuff goes into Manhattan every day? Because it's a bunch of individual managers of restaurants 
placing their individual orders and those are getting aggregated up. Likewise, taxis and Ubers, all of those people are like waiting in different places. And, and they're usually pretty intelligently distributed, but there's nobody saying, okay, we need 4,700 here and 600 here. It's all these individual Uber drivers and, and, and taxi with their own little algorithms making decisions in their own microcosm about what to do. And it's identical to the bees. Yeah, this this is kind of classic economic theory, starting with Adam Smith. Uh, you know, how, how, does the, how, how, do, how does London know how many bagels it needs tomorrow mm. at noon? Well, it doesn't. Nobody does. There's, there's no economic planner that can figure that out. Short of just surveying every single bagel, bagel server uh, for a year to figure out, and uh, you know how many on average, and then it varies by the season. Whatever you can make a prediction, but it depends on the individual uh, organisms, bagel makers, or whatever. In the same way that um, individual neurons are not conscious. I'm not a panpsychist. There are people that think individual neurons and atoms are sentient or conscious or whatever. I don't go that far, but but there is a brain that they make up that is conscious, it is sentient, it is aware, self-aware, and so on. And you can scale that down all the way to your dog is sentient and conscious on some some level less than yours and all the way down to the single cell organism that's following a chemical gradient in a path toward you know whatever it's consuming or toward the light or something like that. It doesn't even know it's sentient, but it, but it, it, so it, here it depends on what you mean by conscious or sentient, uh, you know, if, if, it, if it require self-awareness, you know, you have to pass the mirror test, say, mm -hmm. then very few organisms are conscious and sentient. But if you're willing to chuck that and say, how about just responding to the environment in some intentional way to achieve a goal, then pretty much all organisms are conscious and sentient because they're all goal oriented. So I, I don't know. I think much of this turns, you and I may not disagree at all. It may be just be uh, arguing about what scientists mean by this particular term and what definitions they're using to see what counts, what goes in that category. I think you're right to invoke Adam Smith. And, you know, he talked about the invisible hand. Yeah. But the question he never asked is, whose hand is it? And I think it's Agora's hand. Well, it's nobody's it, hand. This is, I think, the point. It's a bottom-up no, no, emergent no, see, property I, of lots of little people just running around doing the. Or it's, that's like saying that's what you are. Yeah, but okay, let me ask you this. Where is unemployment? Um, unem I like, I, I'm not... Uh, where is unemployment? You're saying, how does that fit into the larger theory? Yeah, well, let me, I, that's a bad that question. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. It, it's a question I ask of people that, uh, uh, you know, claim there's, you, you have to drill down to the individual neuron to find volition and free will, and it's not there, therefore there's no free will, we're all determined. We're just billiard ball, balls in the universe bouncing around. To which I say, well, what about unemployment? Where is that in the neurons? It doesn't anywhere. It's an emergent property of economic systems of people just running around doing their thing and some are out of work and some are not. In other words, I agree that there are emergent properties that have nothing to do with any of the individuals, but collectively there's something we call unemployment or inflation or whatever economic mm -hmm. concepts you want to use. So, Well, I tell you what, let me, let me, let me start over. Maybe we don't have to dwell on, on the words. But what I tried to do was develop an actual science around what a superorganism is. And my operating thesis was the, the, the relationship between your cell and you, because we, we can internalize that. Now, in theory, your cells could be made of smaller, smaller creatures. We don't think they are. Like, we can see them down to almost a molecular level. We don't think they are. But there's nothing conceptually that would keep cells from being made of these tiny, minuscule cells that themselves may be made of tiny, minuscule ones. What we talk about are different levels of order. We know that multicellular organisms, we think they came about because um, a bunch of like things kind of clustered together, and then they uh, specialized, and some of them became better at one thing and another, and then they said, hey, this is working out for all of us. And eventually you had multicellular organisms, and somewhere along the way you got uh, this emergent consciousness. So if, if cells come together and form people, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea that people come together to form agora and that agoras come together to form something higher. In fact, it would be odd if it weren't the case that you couldn't order the matter in a different level and get a different level of being. And that's what I, I think agora is. It's just another level of existence. And what I think is exciting about it 
is that it purports to say why we are here. And science does not like why questions. Science loves how questions, when questions. But why, why we are here, I think you can actually come up with a scientific answer to that question by thinking about Agora. Oh, I, yeah, I, some scientists don't like those kind of why questions. Evolutionary biologists tend to like them. They're looking for ultimate versus proximate explanations, and those are why kind of questions. You know, why is sex good? Well, you know, you can track the neural uh, pathways or whatever, dopamine hit and, and, and serotonin and, and oxytocin especially, whatever. But, the, but that's not answering the why. You know, there you need evolutionary theory because the survival of the species and so on. Um, uh, well, let me give you my why. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, I know you know the Gaia hypothesis. James Lovelock puts mm -hmm. it forth that all the living systems on the Earth function as a living organism that holds certain parameters within uh, variables conducive to life. Why is the salinity of the oceans constant if every day rivers dump more salt into the oceans? Well, there's a convection that pulls it down. Why is the oxygen level in the atmosphere constant for 500 million years uh, when you would think it would be like all over the map? Um, and and it, it behaves. It, you don't have to believe it's alive. You just have to believe that it behaves as if it is alive. I, I got really interested with my last book. I got really interested in, in a simple question, which is why there's just one intelligent species on this planet? Why is there just us? And you can argue dolphins and all that you want to, but there, there's no question we are so different. We're yeah. essentially yeah. aliens, right? Okay. So why would there just be one creature? One yeah. creature. One yeah. smart one. And, and I wrote an entire book trying to figure that out, and I, th I think I did. Um, if, if Gaia behaves as if it's alive, behaves that way, what would it want? Well, it would want what all living things want. Presumably, it would want to live, and it would want to reproduce. Take the first one. It would want to live. Should it worry about dying? Should Gaia worry about dying uh, or behave as if it does? Uh, of course it should. It's going to get hit by a giant rock. I mean, it's, it's a statistical inevitability. A big old asteroid's going to hit this planet. So what would it do? You see, I think intelligence is inherently incredibly destructive to life. 99.99, as many nines as you want to go out, percent of all life isn't intelligent. And it does just fine. Bacteria aren't intelligent. All these things aren't intelligent. I think that intelligence is, is, is corrosive to life. Carl Sagan, that was his answer to the Fermi hypothesis, that once you get smart enough uh, to, to a certain level, you blow yourself up. So here's my answer. If you are Gaia, and whether, again, it's alive or just behaves, it's a system that functions that way. If your tendency is to not produce anything that's intelligent, you're going to get hit by a rock and you die. You just got weeded out. And if your tendency is to produce lots of smart things, well, that's just as bad. I mean, you're going to get, one of them is going to blow everything up and you're in bad shape. But what you want to do is produce just one. And that's still very risky, but you need it because you need something that uh, they can come together and form this higher organism that actually can deflect the asteroid, uh, that can protect the planet. And so I think that's our why. I think we are here. Yeah. I think we are the inevitable product of evolution that would produce us to protect this planet because planets that go either other way, either zero intelligent life or multiple, don't reproduce. And we can talk about reproduction in a minute. But that's my answer to why we're here. Yeah, interesting. And okay. Why Agora's but, but here. But even the language you're using is very anthropocentric. You know, what does it want? Mm -hmm. What is the it? When you well, say Gaia, again, what, can, what is that? Mm -hmm. Again, I, it, Lovelock was always very vague about whether he thought it was really alive or just behaved like a living system. And it doesn't matter. You can say a system has wants. You could say your car wants to burn premium fuel. That's a, a, not a nonsensical statement. Uh, it doesn't matter if it has a, a self that wants it or the system is just engineered to operate better with those parameters. And so if, if you're like, I don't want to think guy is alive, great, fine. It is a, a non-living system that either produces too much intelligent life or none, 
both of which are destroyed, and but but occasionally produces enough intelligent life to protect the system. Yeah. So again, this it does turn on language. It's very what you're describing is very teleological or goal oriented. I think uh, life and evolution is far more contingent than that. Just take ourselves. You know, we're we're the one. Well, it, it was pretty contingent that we're the one. We could have gotten all the way up to the level of Neanderthals and gone extinct uh, right alongside Neanderthals. And we don't know completely why um, they went extinct. We survived. Could have gone the other way. Or we could have all gone extinct. There were a dozen different um, hominids at the, at living at the same time. Correct. And, and the they're all gone. That hap- and the rats, right. The kinds of But you're not suggesting that-, that something called Gaia weeded out the one, all the others because it only needed one. And we got, no, th- we're the lucky, no. lucky ones. No, I would say there's a gene in the system. Uh, There's a tendency. Let's let's take it and make it non-teleological. There's a a system um, that contains the life on this planet, and that system, uh, if it produces a lot of intelligence, uh, that intelligence is very destructive, and if it fails to produce intelligence, uh, those get weeded out. So it's just Darwinian natural selection. All the kinds of systems that produce uh, too much or too little are destroyed, leaving... Now, this only works if it can reproduce and copy itself. And I believe it can. I believe in panspermia, the idea... So, I love this idea. Like, think about this for just a second. Life began on planet Earth basically 15 minutes after the surface of the planet cooled. It, It started right away. And that's a huge mystery because here's what we don't, we don't know why it happened so quickly because it only ever happened once. It only ever persisted once. We know this because all life on this planet, you know, you, you not only. No, it may have happened many times and they all just died out. Only once it persisted. Only when it persisted. That's what I was saying. Because of the, but because of the rock cycle, all the evidence would have, was gone now. No, no, we know that they didn't persist because you 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 share sixty percent of your DNA with a banana. Oh, but I'm saying we, you know three billion years ago there might have been a dozen experiments. May, maybe not. Absolutely, and absolutely. they're gone now. But but we do know that one did live. Yeah, that's a, and it was right. formed very early, and it was seemingly formed in its full complexity. Why do we know that? Because you and a banana share genes. So. Your common ancestor had to have those genes. So somehow life came here completely fully formed, not in some proto-life. Now, the idea of panspermia, that simply that we, not not like aliens put us here or anything like that. Uh, it's, it, it's an old idea. It goes back to Lord Kelvin and, and earlier that, that biological matter like DNA can survive in space. So when one of those rocks hits those planets and blasts it into millions of pieces, and those drift through space forever, and they rain down on other worlds, that DNA does. Now, you see, you should be made of elements, we think, that mirror elements on, the, on, on Earth, but you're not. There are things in you that are common, that are rare on Earth. They're more common on Mars, by the way. But you don't really match this planet. So what I think happens, what I suspect happens, is that Remember, the Goldilocks amount of intelligence is one. Too many, they blow themselves up. Too few, the asteroid hits Yeah, them. even that, I, I, I can't go with you there. Okay, well, I mean, hold, you, let you me bookmark an, it. You only have an <laughs> N of one. Um, but let me just bookmark it, because what it explains is that uh, what happens is over... So our sun is a third-generation sun. There was a sun, it lived five billion years, it blew up, coalesced, the second sun, we got the third one. So this has been going on for a long time. It's perfectly reasonable that biological matter has been floating around in the billions of years before that. Earth forms, it starts to cool, it lands here, fully formed, amazing, only once. Only once it persisted. What do you you mean fully formed? DNA is written in four letters, GTCA, right? And it is uh, incredibly complex, like... Uh, and you and a banana use the same four letters. You share 60% of your genes. So your common ancestor had those genes, which meant it had DNA, double helix DNA with four, uh, with GTCA. It didn't. That's not what origins of life scientists think happened. They think there's an RNA 
see, uh, a, a prequel to DNA. Fair enough, then. You yeah. and the banana, you and the banana share. That, that, but not, they so not, not fully formed. No. Well, no. Incremental it, well, steps. Uh, no. What would be the incremental step that leaves you and a banana with 60% of the same genes? Well, at some point, well, that means your it, at some point you get a, a bifurcation where the one experiment takes off, and that's uh -huh. every living organism today sharing that. You know, Paul Davies has this hypothesis of a second genesis. Let's find it. Let's look for uh, extraterrestrial life, so to speak, here on Earth. That is another genesis where uh -huh. if we found an organism that didn't have DNA, it had something like you know, a prequel, prequel to RNA or something like that. Now, we haven't found that yet, but it's an interesting hypothesis. There's no reason to think, again, trying to remove the teleos and anthropocentrism that we really are super, super, super special. Because look, Gaia picked us. I'm uncomfortable with no, all I of the language. Us. No, I picked us. You, I keep, I keep going back and saying you can think of it as a non-living system that just if it has a propensity to produce a lot of life, it does not perpetuate. If it doesn't produce life, uh, intelligence, it does not perpe perpetuate. What, where would the will in that be even? Wouldn't you expect that a system that... Do you accept the hypothesis that a system that doesn't produce intelligence will get hit by an asteroid? Like, that seems statistically certain. Mm -hmm. And do yeah, you so accept that it, the Fermi hypothesis asks a very valid question, mm -hmm. which is why don't we hear... Aliens everywhere. But, but as you know, the the the, the uh, you know the L in the Drake equation of lifetime mm -hmm. of civilizations, we have no idea what that is. People just make up numbers: fifty thousand, ten thousand. Mm. I've made up a number: four hundred and ten. That's the number of years the average civilization lasts. Because it's not life or civilization in a generic sense that has to continue. You actually need a political entity that funds space exploration and telescopes and things like that, or else we're not going to detect them and they're not going to detect us. Mm -hmm. So, but whatever, I mean, the numbers, no one knows because we only have an N of one. So the idea that, well, uh, civilizations get super intelligent, then they, uh, then they cause their own extinction through global warming or nuclear war or whatever it is. You know, we, it, that hasn't happened to us yet. So why why would we think that's the answer to Fermi's paradox? Well, there's, we there's, there's 49 other answers mm. <laughs> to Fermi's paradox. That's just one of them. We don't know. Uh, you're right. Of course we don't. The, the idea that there's this great filter, that, uh, that civilizations will develop an ability to destroy themselves, right? Like, that seems reasonable that they could do I that. I don't know. We haven't done it yet. No, no. Could we? In principle, we could, yes, ah, of okay. course. So it, it, would, it would become possible. <laughs> but that doesn't mean to... that somebody else did, and that doesn't mean we right. will. You know, we're also mm -hmm. sentient and well self-aware enough to know we can do something about it. And there's those of us working to try to prevent that, or someone mm -hmm. like Elon saying, just in case, let's go plant a flag on Mars and, and get a, another civilization going there, just in case, in any case. I think uh, the part of the problem is that they they... Uh, intelligent civilizations could be all over the place in the cosmos. The distances are so vast, we just can't pick up their signals. We just don't know that they're there. And we've only been looking for, I don't know, half a century or so. You know, um, you know, there's a whole branch of looking for techno signatures now, people like Avi Loeb at Harvard, looking for Dyson spheres or objects that mm -hmm. come in from interstellar uh, regions that are technologically based. You know, it, it could he could find something. He's going later this year to troll through the bottom of the ocean again to try to find artifacts of that could be. Um, but we, again, it's just, we know so little and the distances are so vast. This is my explanation. This is my answer to the Fermi paradox. They're probably all over the place uh, simply because of the number of possibilities, you know, trillions and trillions of planets. Once you do the, the, the numbers, hundreds of billions, maybe a trillion galaxies, each of them has hundreds of billions of stars. Mm -hmm. All those stars have half a dozen to a dozen different planets, no matter how, improbable it is any one place is going to have life let alone intelligent life no matter how low it is the number raw number is so high they just have to be out there but the problem is is it, it's mostly just empty space i mean avi points out that if we sent the fastest rocket ever built toward uh, uh andromeda is not a good one a good example because it's coming toward us but you know, pretty much any other galaxy it'll never get there because the galaxies are expanding away from one another faster than any chemical propulsion system could ever produce to catch mm -hmm. up with them. So we'll never get, we'll never be able to explore it. I and, think, mm -hmm. so anyway, I just think they're there. Yeah, they I haven't just come think here. That our future as a species, I think, 
uh, is to populate a billion planets with a billion people each. You know, we've gone from 8 million people to 8 billion in just 10,000 short years. And, and I think, you know, we look at, at, at space that, as you say, you know, my favorite big space analogy or uh, example is that if you take a grain of sand and you put it on your fingertip and you hold it out at arm's length and you look at that grain of sand, you have to realize that's blocking your view of 30,000 galaxies. Mm-hmm. Like, that is just amazing to me. Mm-hmm. And so I have to think we're going we're gonna to go out and populate a billion more planets. And I think perhaps other creatures would have done the same. They would be building probes that would come around and uh, uh, thousands. They could maybe. reproduce them. Maybe. Yeah. But again, well, it, I guess, it, I guess it, what, they, they could have built you know, a million mm-hmm. probes and they'd still miss us. Mm-hmm. I mean, just take the Voyager spacecraft. They're, you know, they're leaving the solar system. They're mm-hmm. not going to hit anything. They're just going to carry on for billions right. of years. And they'll never hit, you know, I mean, they have the plaque on there just in case. Okay, that's cool. But, you know, chances are pretty, pretty low. The analogy I use is the when I learned taking astronomy, you know, if our sun was the size of an orange in L.A., the closest star would be an orange in Chicago. It's 2,000 miles. There's just nothing. It's mostly just empty space. So even if they're all over the place, they could easily miss us. Assuming the UFO people aren't right in there, they are. It here. is true. <laughs> One atom per sixty-eight gallons of empty space. That's, yeah, that's the yeah. Uh, matter distribution. Nothing. But what I guess, it, but but mm-hmm. Byron, here, here's the, I, I'm, I'm part part of the way there with you. Part of it, I'll just give you my concerns of having done this for for decades. Is that there's a certain kind of new ageish, um, I don't know, metaphysical thing built into this teleological thing that it's. It's also anthropocentric. It's there for, you know, it, it, we're super special. We're back in. It's no longer the Copernican principle. He knocked us off our pedestal. We're back in. And it's Agora or it's Gaia or it's, you know, some kind of spirit. But or, I can you, you rephrase know, it all without. Or, or the any laws of, that. of nature or, you know, somehow knew we were I coming. Ref- this yeah. anthro- I anthropic, can you know, the anthropic all. principle. Somehow mm-hmm. the laws of nature knew we were coming, you know, mm-hmm. and, and designed us that way. The, yeah, I'm okay. not saying any of that. Uh, let me rephrase it, which is complex systems. Um, uh, complex systems beget other can have multiple layers of complexity. Bees can cells can form creatures, creatures can form beehives, and there's no limit in theory to to where it goes up. And those increasing levels of complexity have new emerging capabilities. Yeah. And the emerging capabilities of humans is that you know uh, we can build an iPhone. No human can build an iPhone, but there's an emergent Sure. Human yep. can build an yep. iPhone. Yep. Um, the Earth pr- presumably is also a complex system, and that system um, can be destroyed, or that system can operate. And if it p- produces something that can protect it, a, a chemical, a pheromone, a property that it just naturally happens to stumble upon, then it can perpetuate itself the way that any creature can evolve a defense against any potential threat. So if it can evolve a, a, a defense against an asteroid, what would that look like? Well, I guess it, it could evolve a hard shell or some other things, or it could involve an intelligent thing that is able, that has a vested interest, a system that it too uh, wants to perpetuate itself. So you don't have to, I, I use that language can, as a convenience. My car wants to burn yeah. Thing. But yeah. to say this is new age, what I try to do is treat it as a biological entity. I say if it is a superorganism, there will be certain things you can say about it. One, humans cannot function outside of it. Bees cannot function outside of the hive. Ants cannot function outside of the nest. That's a testable hypothesis. Can people have people specialized to such a degree they cannot live a part of civilization? If that is true, okay, well, that is suggestive that we are a superorganism. We are specialized cells. Your body has 250 different types of cells. They come together, form an emergent you. The U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics tracks 10,000 occupations, and that's the number of different kinds of cells that, that uh, I think Agora has. So that would be the first prediction. Can people live apart from it? I don't think they can. The yeah. second one is that superorganisms demand conformity. Uh, if an ant acts weird, they just kill it and throw it out. And so you say, well, do humans actually require conformity? That doesn't seem like us. And yet, you know, I go into that in great detail. When you look at things like the educational system, which are designed to manufacture a, a very similar things, when so we, we train people to do their function 
like a brain surgeon. We train them to do their function a certain way. And if they deviate from that way, uh, we do not just punish them. We say that is criminal. That is a criminal act. And so we do require this incredibly rigid conformity because if we didn't have it, the superorganism couldn't function. So you would say, okay, well, that's also very interesting. We do seem to be behaving like a superorganism because we demand this conformity of the parts. And that's why two construction workers can show up who don't know each other, can show up on the job and they can exchange just a little information like two ants exchanging pheromones and exchange a little information with language and they can actually work together to accomplish something bigger. So you can go through a series of these and say, do these predictions about what a superorganism made up of humans would, would be like, do they apply to us? And that is a knowable, testable thing. It isn't a new agey thing where I'm, I'm saying anything beyond simple biology, which is uh, a superorganism is a thing, and perhaps we form one, and they have certain attributes, and I believe we have those attributes. Yeah, I think this is like the distinction between the weak and strong anthropic principle. You know, the weak version is it that in order to have astronomers to ask why there's something rather than nothing or why uh, things are designed that the way that they are, you have to have a planet and a salt in an atmosphere and you have to have living or well, obviously you have to have all that, um, you know, but, but, but the strong version is of that is that the laws of nature themselves have designed or pre-built into them or pre-packaged with a kind of directionality to life where it, it is inevitable that something like a intelligent uh, communicating being like us, it doesn't have to be us, but something like us would arise again to ask that question. So when, you know, you talk to cosmologists and people that think about this stuff, philosophers or whatnot, you know, that almost everybody's on board with the weak anthropic principle, which is, I think, what you're arguing here for Agora. But is the, is there, are you actually making a case for something like a strong anthropic principle? It was inevitable, just either statistically or, to, you know, kind of prepackaged in the laws of nature, to to uh, that something like us would have inevitably arose on you know rewind the tape and we something like us would be here again inevitable is a, is a, is a really hard thing I, I do know that the earth functioned for three and a half billion years with only single-celled organisms that's that's really amazing to think about for three and a half billion years you just had single cell organisms and then something changed that caused organisms to come together and then to specialize and then to get these emergent properties and form multicellular organisms. And then eventually those multicellular organisms became ever more specialized and they formed things like you. Um, is that an inevitability? Uh, no, because you had three and a half billion years where you didn't have it. So presumably you could have another three and a half billion years where you didn't have it. Um, is it a statistical likelihood uh, that, that the benefits of specialization uh, per create these emergent properties which aid in survival, I would think so. But then one would have to say there is no reason, it's just two levels. There's no reason you have cells, cells come together to form you, and guess what? That's it. There's nothing higher, nothing lower. That's just it. It's two levels. Like that's so arbitrary to think that. And so then to think, well, do people come together and specialize to form other creatures? And if so, could we detect them? And why wouldn't why wouldn't they be alive? Where does your where where do you? If I took you apart a cell at a time and I put those cells in uh, you know in a petri dishes, they could live, but you would have vanished. And and so the question is, were you ever even there? Well, of course you were. You were a pattern, and and there's, there's no reason to believe that a pattern of humans wouldn't form something even more emergent. And we even have evidence of it. We have emergent capabilities that no human can do. And we have not always had those. Certainly, uh, language is part of that. That's another emergent phenomenon of mm -hmm. communicating organisms in a entity called whatever, a group, a city, a town, a village, whatever. All that's true. Yeah, those exist. But um, so I guess this is the question in front, between the weak and strong versions of your theory. You know, does is the city itself aware or sentient or... Something like that, um, how do you think about like a city? That is the right question to ask. Um, and of course, I don't know. I, I will say you, 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 talk, you said language, and, and you're right. That is one of, emergence is a really interesting phenomenon. 
Like at some level, we understand why the clock can keep time, even though none of the gears can keep time, because it's the pattern of how they all work together. But when you dissect that and you say, what are the, how does that come about? There really are about five things that are necessary for that to happen. You have to obviously have energy to animate it. You have to have some amount of specialization, otherwise you just have a pile of it. You have to have some amount of communication where the things can communicate with each other and, and so forth. I go through those in incredible detail because I think you really have to understand where that, where that comes about, how emergence can happen. So, would a city be conscious? Um, and by the way, a city is the right way to think about it. Uh, I won't go into that. It's, it's about well, even more so than a nation state, which seems far more fluid and changing than cities. Well, it has no biological reality. The nation state does. The city actually does. The city yeah. is a thing. Uh, the earliest ones, by the way, were round houses mm -hmm. all abutting each other that look from the air exactly like single cell organisms close you, you mean together. Like exactly. Turkey. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Although that's, they're not all like that, although I guess no, in the no, Native no, American not. I, I, Adobe I'm not one. using that as, as proof, but yeah. even that looks like, uh, even that looks like uh, celery stock or yeah. like a plant yeah. thing. Uh, but it does suggest you get this non-differentiated stuff that comes together, and then very quickly you see it specializing, and you get parts that, that do this and parts that do this, and the city becomes this thing. So I will argue it both ways. The argument that it is conscious is to say, if consciousness arises from complexity, which is a tenable theory, that and which it sounds like you adhere to, that the neuron is not conscious, but it's some the dog is semi-conscious all the way up, that this complexity begets it, then it is unquestionable that the city is more complex than you. Yeah, for sure. I think of it as a rheostat rather than a light switch. People always talk in consciousness studies, you know, when do the lights come on? Well, mm -hmm. that's the wrong analogy. It's just a dimmer, you know, you just dial it up a little bit. It's hard to know what the what the levels of change would be. You know, a thousand neurons, a hundred thousand neurons. You know, uh, uh, what is it? A you know the C. elegant worms has three hundred and two oh. neurons, or whatever. The, the garden snail has sixty thousand worms mm -hmm. uh, neurons. You know, uh, what what's the magic number where something starts to mm -hmm. happen? And I don't think anybody has the right answer. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's just it just becomes ever more whatever, sentient or aware, right. uh, aware of its environment or however you want to define it. See, you know? elegance, obviously, with its 302 neurons, obviously, it displays complex behavior. So mm -hmm. it has emergent, it can go towards food, it can reproduce, um, and so forth. So that would be the argument for, to say that the city is more complex. It is made up of even more complex things. But just take, like, on the city example, there's, you know, those studies showing the effects of power laws on cities, you know, how many gas stations do you have per size of the city? The bigger the city gets, the fewer gas stations you need per 100,000 people or whatever. It becomes more efficient as it gets larger. So New York City is far more efficient. It, New York City doesn't need as nearly, maybe that's not a good example because everybody uses subways, but you know, take Los Angeles. You know, you, it, it, it doesn't have nearly as many gas stations per number of people as a small town does. But there's nobody designing this. There's no mayor, you know, making decisions about how many gas That's, stations we need. Right. It's all bottom up. It's just emergent property of Correct. people just doing stuff. And yet, That's what you are, though. That's what you are. Yeah, you are a bunch yeah. of cells just doing stuff. Yeah. And what you have just described about levels of complexity in cities applies to multicellular life as well. You are a more efficient creature than other ones down below. Yeah. Well, okay, so the city is an agora. Uh-huh. Yeah. Really, it's all of humanity because it all communicates. There is an analogy to ants. It's called unicolonality, where the ants live in different colonies, but you could move them between them, just like people can move between them. Mm -hmm. All right, one of your specialties is AI. Let's use this as an example of, you know, the substrate independence argument. You don't need wet meat like neurons. You could have silicon chips. Do you think that's possible? Is it substrate neutral? Does it matter what the stuff is made out of? You could get sentience and awareness and consciousness and whatever else you want to go if higher up. Well, I wrote a whole book on this topic. Okay. On whether machines can be conscious. All it's right. my book, The Fourth answer? Age. It's in 12, um, 12 languages. Uh, the it, it, it depends on the answer to a simple question, which is, are people machines? I would assume you do believe people are machines. That there's nothing in a person that cannot be described. Using molecular machine, sure, yeah, correct. 
So if people are machines, by the way, I had a podcast. I had 110 guests on it, and they were the, I mean, they were the, I love AI because you can still access people who <laughs> have been kind of at the beginning of it. I mean, just amazing people. And there have been few things in history where the people involved in it at the moment knew the, the momentous, like the, uh, the uh, Manhattan Project is one. They knew what they were doing uh, was momentous for good or ill. Mm -hmm. uh, and the AI people do as well. And there's a lot of self-reflection in that community. Mm -hmm. uh, they know it's a big deal. Um, and I ask 110 people, do you believe you are a machine? Uh, AI people. And only three uh, said no. And uh, all the rest said yes. So mm -hmm. that is, I think, the animating belief beyond, behind that. So if you are a machine, then uh, someday we'll build a mechanical person, and then two years later, it'll be twice as smart and twice as smart and twice as smart. Of course, the argument that you are not a machine does not have to appeal to spiritualism. Uh, you could say this. Um, you could say, uh, like if I ask you what color was your first bicycle or um, what was the name of your first grade teacher, you could probably recall those things, even if you hadn't thought about them for like 20 years. Mm. And we don't know how you do that. That's really amazing because there's no bicycle location in your brain and no teacher location mm -hmm. in your brain, and yet you just did it. So we don't know that. And then what, what, what's even more amazing is that the brain gives rise to something called the mind. And whatever, however you want to define the mind, we can just say the mind is all of these things the brain does that does not seem like what an organ should be able to do. Your heart does not have a sense of humor. Your stomach does not have a sense of humor. And yet you, your brain, does have a sense of humor. So somehow... These mysterious brains give rise to these minds we don't understand. And then somehow those minds give rise to consciousness. Consciousness has been called the last scientific question. We don't even know how to ask scientifically. We don't have an, a way to phrase the question, how can matter have an experience of something? So you could argue that we have these brains we don't understand that give rise to these minds we don't understand that give rise to consciousness we do not understand. And so therefore, there is no reason to believe you can manufacture that in a fab in Palo Alto. <laughs> so you don't think chat GPT is sentient yet? Okay, good. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think there's a very interesting question about why it freaked but everybody out. Wait, wait a minute. Did I, if I followed your thread there, you're saying that 10 more years of chat GPT development will never get to sentience? I believe that. I, Be because, no, no, they're no, I wrong, because they're on no, the wrong Because they're on the wrong track or, I would say it this or way. even impressive. I have no reason to believe that. I think it's a false equivalent. Mm. You see, pattern people are just amazing at pattern recognition. So when you talk to that thing, it sure seems like an it. And by the way, it represents itself as an it. It says I have only been trained on data up till this. I mean, you want to go uh, go off on your teleological thing, like that it claims to have an eye, which was just hard-coded into it. It does yeah. not have an yeah. eye, right? Yeah. So it, it purports to, but it does not. Um, so I do not know the scientific reason to believe that, that, I mean, that's what the Human Brain Project in, in Europe is, multi-billion euro project that says, let's try to reproduce what the brain does yeah. in silicon and, and we're going to make a, a brain, a human brain, you know, a, a thinking brain. I, 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 I have no reason to believe that's true until you well, can tell me. Do, do you mean uh, even, even in principle? I mean, you could say, well, those guys are off on the wrong track. What if somebody was on the right track? Are you saying there is no right track? No, no, no. Again, the burden of proof is on somebody who says they can do it. Yeah. Not, I don't have to prove a universal negative. I, have to, I take people who say, well, yeah, I don't understand how the brain works. I don't understand how the mind works. I don't understand how consciousness works. But we're going to make one, by golly. Those are the people who have the burden of proof, not me to somehow say it's impossible. And, sure, and, and but... have, they, have they even attempted that proof? Have they even explained why? They make an assertion that people are machines and therefore... Yeah, I, I share your skepticism in the burden of proof argument. But I, I, what I'm saying is, I don't know, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, it seems I possible. So. It seems possible that they mm -hmm. could do it. Are you saying no? I mean, I personally... But again, I could be wrong. I mean, I, I don't assert any kind of privileged knowledge, I just know enough about, I mean, it's Python code. It's simple Python code. You can look at it and figure out what it's doing. Mm. 
And so I can look at it and tell what it's doing. I cannot look at your brain and tell what it is doing. And so to think, well, oh, yeah, no, that's it. That's it. Just more of that. More of that. And we're going to get there. Yeah. It just, I, I just don't have any confidence in that. Let's think about this for a second. The difference between the weak and, and um, hard problem. Uh, sorry, the easy mm -hmm. and hard problem of consciousness. So when you say, well, we don't know what the brain's doing. Yes, we do. We have a really good idea of what the brain is doing. You know, where, you know how does it process smells or speech, visual tracks, and so on. We really have a deep understanding of that. Uh, through brain mapping and so on. The hard problem, though, it, the, the next step, th that mm -hmm. is what it's like to be the wiring, mm -hmm. that seems to me a conceptually problematic way to phrase it. it. Here's how I think about it. What's it like to be you? It's the same question as what it's like to be a bat or what it's like mm -hmm. to be a dolphin. I don't know. If I knew, I would just be a bat or a dolphin. If I knew what it's like to be you... The only way to really know is to just be you. But then I wouldn't be Michael Shermer asking, what's it like to be Byron Reese? I would just be Byron Reese. I wouldn't even know I'm asking, anybody's asking the question. It seems to me it's based on this idea that's kind of uh, a, a revision of dualism. Like there's a little uh, homunculus in there, a little mini me that can kind of transport over into your skull to see if the red looks the same as it looks on my Cartesian theater as it does in yours. And, and of course, this is an absurd idea. Um, you know, and even if I, you know, went inside my little closet over there and closed the door and made noises and I could hear them bouncing off the walls and have a sense that the wall is this far away based on the sound. And this must be what it's like to be a bat or a dolphin with echolocation. But, but, it, but, but, but I'd still be me just asking the question going, oh, maybe it's like this. But if, if I had the full immersion experience where I was actually experiencing what it's like to be a bat, I would just be a bat. I wouldn't be a human now. No, it's like the uh, Kafka Kafka -esque story about the cockroach. The guy who wakes up as a cockroach or whatever it was. You know, the, the, again, it's like who's in there uh, uh, inside the cockroach being aware of this? It's like the Freaky Friday, you know, or Jamie Lee Curtis and and and, uh, um, and and what's her name, Lindsay Lohan switch bodies, and the teenage girls now the, the middle aged mm -hmm. mom, the middle aged moms in high school, and hilarity ensues. But this is all based on this dualism. Like there's some non entity, non physical entity that transports over into the other body. And anyway, I'm a materialist. I'm a monist. I, I don't think there's any such thing as mind separate from just what the brain does. Uh, it's it's a word that we all use, and I use it. But 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 it's been reified into this thing that's floating around. Like if my brain dies, my body dies, you know, I'm dead. Somehow my my consciousness is going to float off the neurons and the networks and go off into some mm -hmm. quantum uh, field somewhere or whatever it is. Uh, and, and I think th this is th there's no evidence. Not only is there no evidence, it's a conceptually problematic idea. Well, you're obviously versed forward and backwards uh, in all of the issues. I mean, you referenced the problem of Mary in the red. You didn't mention the Chinese room, but you still have that. Uh, what it's like to be a bat versus what it's like to be a chair. And, and so we can both agree we're on well-trod paths here. And you're entirely right. It does boil down to a question of dualism and monism. And that's what my entire book is about. Um, and where do you come down on that personally? Well, after? the book isn't about what, what I think. You see, I'm... But I want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious I'll, what you I'll think. Answer, no, okay. I'll, answer, <laughs> I'll answer it very directly. But to be clear, I was trying to write a book that explained why there were people who think AI is going to like save the world and usher in utopia. And there are people who think it's going to, you know, destroy us all. And they're equally smart people in that industry. And so they must believe something different. And, and I was trying to get at what it is they believe differently. Mm -hmm. and, and so the book is just me being a, a guide through that uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, you can, you know, People, Dan Dennett, you mentioned him in one of your emails, uh, Consciousness Explained, uh, criticized by some as being Consciousness Explained Away, which is, <laughs> mm -hmm. is what you seem to be doing. Uh, because I think it was Rousseau. Oh, no, it wasn't Rousseau. They have somebody, you know, do you have free will? And he goes, everything I can reason says I don't, but everything I feel says I do. Uh, and that mm -hmm. really is, I feel like I do, mm -hmm. but I can't reason it. You have to, no, you don't have to. I would suspect one would normally believe that 
I can put a thermometer in a warm bath and it will measure the temperature. I can put my hand in a warm bath and I will feel warmth. And those are different things. And, and it, it, to say, oh, no, they're not. It's all just brain stuff. And, and then to somehow do this reversal thing where you say the burden of, is on you to prove they're different. I would just come to that. You can say, well, all the intellectual stuff you can say says, sure, they're all the same. But all the experience you have is that no, there's a difference. I'm, I'm not saying that. Yeah, no, this okay. is, we, we don't need to play burden tennis <laughs> where we whack it back and forth across the net. Uh, I agree. Consciousness is real. I, it, I, it's it's mm. real in my head. It's real in yours. I apply the Copernican principle or the principle of mediocrity to myself. I'm not special, so the the chances that I'm the only sentient being in the universe and everybody else is a zombie, come on. <laughs> what are the chances of that? You know, if I see the expressions on your face and they match what I know about, you know, my expressions on my face and what I'm feeling, you're probably feeling something similar. What, what I'm saying is the hard problem where it's asked mm -hmm. what it's like to be this other thing, how would you know that? I don't doubt that you have it. I, of course you do real i think consciousness is real i think the self is real i think volition is real within you know restrictions i'm a compatibilist um but but proving it see this may be one of these known unknowns or unknowables um that we're we're coming about it conceptually in a way i don't think is going to get us there which is why i brought up the ai thing you know I, you know take data on star trek you know, that episode is data alive, you uh, know, the scientist know wants will. to dismantle him and, mm -hmm. and the crew says, no, we have to defend him. He's a person. All right. Well, this depends on what you mean by person. But, you know, in this particular case, data is played by an actor. So he's crossed the uncanny valley and sure seems like a, you know, like a, a, a living person and so on. But uh, but to ultimately say what it's like to be the silicon chips again how would I know the Chinese room example? You mentioned people not familiar with that uh, is that, uh, you know, you have this machine and you feed in you know, Chinese characters and out comes the translation and you think, well, this person inside there really knows Chinese. It's a person, but it's just an algorithm generating the translation. It's not sentient at all. You know, that, that seems to me a, a, a really difficult problem to get around. I, how would you ever know that, um, you know, Watson or whatever, Deep Blue is is conscious. I, I always like to make a joke about you know Watson beating Ken Jennings on Jeopardy. You know the was it excited that it beat the greatest uh, Jeopardy player of all time? <laughs> of course not. Doesn't even know it's playing Jeopardy. <laughs> you know, but you could program into it. It, it cheers. You know, yeah, I won. <laughs> and it and it uh, and it gives expressions that you and I would recognize as it's happy that it won, something like that. But 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 how would we ever know really inside? Does it really feel? Like, hey, I, I I feel so good about myself. I beat Ken Jennings in Jeopardy. Uh, I mean, you could say you program that, but I would never know what it's actually like inside the machinery mm. if it really feels that or not. And uh, I don't know. To me, it, now well, we're bumping up into a wall mm, of like. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. I will say something that might surprise you though, which is, um, and in that book I, I referenced, I have a conversation that conversation where the computer is representing that it is. You do. Um, where <laughs> yeah, it says, I'm, I'm alive, but you coded me and all that. I do think at some level, if in doubt, you have to give it right. Because mm -hmm. history is far too many examples of things that we say cannot feel pain. You know, you know that we operated on babies, human babies, up until the 90s with no anesthesia because we felt like they couldn't feel pain. And veterinarians in the United States were trained until 1995 that animals cannot feel pain, that you can operate on them without anesthesia. And although they, they give these outward signs that they feel pain, um, they, they don't actually. Wait, That's do you just, mean 1890s? No. Because I doubt that. That seems, because okay, I'm you, old enough to remember. Check me. No, you fact check me. Because I've had I, dogs have surgery and they had uh -huh, anesthesia uh -huh. in like the 70s and 80s. Uh -huh. You fact check me. I, I, I guarantee you this. Because before I put that in the book, believe me, I ran that 12 ways to Sunday. Because I was like, that cannot be. You cannot hear that dog screaming, you know, yipping and somehow convince yourself. You, that, couldn't, um, you couldn't even do the surgery on a dog because they'd just be writhing it, around. Well, they were just taught to ignore whatever those signals were. I mean, were. you'd have to have six people in there holding down, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a big dog holding it down because you uh -huh. couldn't do the surgery. And then again, we 
operated on human babies. Uh, I did heart surgery on them with, with no, no, no anesthesia. Fire. Are you sure? I mean, I, this is Don't something I've me. never looked put into. It in, put it in the um, in put it in the liner notes on okay. the no no on the episode. And uh, yeah, uh, okay, I'll check you that. Should, you should be skeptical. I mean, there you was you skeptical. know, there's stuff about Descartes, in Descartes day when people said well animals don't feel pain well what if i kick my dog and it yelps well that's a mechanical device but that's kind of interpretation of what's doing the yelping and is there is there an entity inside aware of the pain you know i i'm quite certain dogs are sentient and feel pain and suffer all the way back to what about trees do you think trees can no i don't think so Hmm. yeah I, I'm with Jeremy Bentham. You know, he famously kind of the grandfather of the animal mm-hmm. rights movement mm-hmm. said it, it isn't can they think or talk, it's can they suffer. And it mm-hmm. seems to me that animals can suffer all the way down to, I don't know, maybe lobsters in a in, in a boiling pot, although apparently that's been challenged now that they can mm-hmm. feel pain. Um, you know, but but trees and plants, no, I, I wouldn't go that far. Well, we certainly, it would be inconvenient to us if they could suffer, wouldn't <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> I mean, because we have to rethink our morality. So we have to be very suspicious of our belief that they can't suffer. And if we it, have to- actually, that makes me think about something, this, you know, synthetic meat. If you're mm-hmm. growing meat from cells in a dish, if you're right, then if it's a fairly complex clump of meat, is it, is it sentient? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're traipsing through all of these different kind of like modal. We need to visit one that we haven't touched on. Okay. And that is the simulation hypothesis. Okay, okay, which, go for it. Which I reject uh, wholeheartedly. And I want to give you my proof against it and, and get your honest feedback. Okay, you yeah. Uh, for, for our listeners, give us the, 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 the quick uh, summary of what that is. So... The idea, uh, there's two assumptions. One is that uh, uh, as we build more complex computers, we are eventually going to be able to simulate, create a simulation like a holodeck in Star Trek uh, that's completely real. And that the cost to reproduce that simulation would be a minuscule. And so you could make a billion copies of it. And so if, if it was undetectable, if it was like so real that it felt real, um, then you wouldn't know. And so the odds are much more likely that you are when one of the billion copies than you are actually in reality. Is that a fair? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so, did, didn't, um, what's his name, Bostron put like a 50% probability or 30% yeah. that some, he had some non-trivial number that we are living in a simulation? Well, I have, uh, I have a twofold refutation, but I'm just going to go through one half of it, which okay. is... Uh, if if uh, the thesis is right that you could make a billion copies of it, um, then the creatures that made the billion copies themselves must themselves be in a simulation. Because what are the odds that they're the mm. prime species? They're not I one like of that. billions. Very good. That's great. And then and then <laughs> the people that made them. <laughs> Wouldn't have been the prime people either. The odds are they are in a simulation. Mm-hmm. So you remember the whole thing about, you know, the earth sits on a turtle, what's below the turtle, another mm-hmm. turtle, what's below that, what's turtles all the way down. The thesis would have to be it simulations all the way up. There's mm-hmm. no creature. This, these makers can't be real. They would be a simulation too. Yeah, I like that argument a lot. Um, well, thank you. But, but doesn't, isn't the argument that, that there has to be hardware somewhere? There has to be a foundation of all this. So it, well, it, it's a, that we're it, in a it, tiny little cube. Yeah, uh, but if you had like a billion, a billion space. simulations running on simulations, at some point they have to be running on a, some hardware somewhere. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what could, they did is they took BDs and they put the supercomputer in them, and then they shot them into the cold depth of space to reproduce mm-hmm. themselves mm-hmm. to to spread themselves out. And so we're just on this little BB floating in the vast... Oh, so there's a, essentially an infinite number of mm-hmm. hardwares. It is it is running on a hardware system, mm-hmm. a substrate system. Yeah, because it seems to me like, like, again, the Copernican principle, if you look outside, what what's the world look like? It doesn't look like it's digitized, buffering with little pixelations or whatever. Maybe they fixed all those problems <laughs> in some... S- some scenario that I've just heard people see that. who believe the simulation hypothesis refer to other human beings as NPCs, non-playing characters. They, they don't have... They refer to them as what? NPCs. It's a word. Like oh. if you play a video game, there's all these like background characters that 
Oh, non-playing sort of, characters. Is that what that's Oh, cool. I see. I didn't know what that is. Yeah. So they're just like these background figures. They don't have any reality. And so you talk about, can they suffer? Well, they can't really. They're just simulations that you yeah. really shouldn't yeah. be concerned about. So I think it's so corrosive to, you know, we had to claw our way to have human rights. The idea that there are things you <laughs> right. cannot do to a human yeah. being. Yeah. No matter who they are, you cannot do that to a human being because humans have rights. Right. Um, and, and I think it really corrodes that notion that there's something. And that's also, by the way, what worries me about uh, robots and things like ChatGPT. And when we, when we embody these systems and we give them names. Because mm-hmm. you can imagine the day when we have like a, a, a grandpa, you get some humanoid, vaguely humanoid looking robot, that, just vaguely humanoid, that sits with grandpa and they share jokes and all of that. And, you know, everybody knows it's a robot. Uh, But do you know when people send their room, when their Roomba breaks? Yeah, the Roomba. (laughs) They want their Roomba back. They want it fixed. They don't want a new Roomba. And so when that thing breaks, Grandpa is going to want it fixed. It doesn't just want a new one, right? There was was an article in today's Wall Street Journal about, um, uh, 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 like, if your child has been killed in a mass public shooting, or a school shooting, you can like upload all their memories into an AI, and it'll talk. You have some recordings. Yeah, here it is. Oh my! A- AI, look look at this. AI brings back voices of children shot dead. Holy crap! That is unbelievable. I, you know, I have children. I, I just can't. I have no idea if I would just be totally freaked out about that, or if it would make me happy, or say I don't. That just seems astonishing. Well, I have used up more time than you had uh, allocated for this. I hope uh, I hope it was fun for you. Oh, you want to? Oh, okay. All no, right. No, no, yeah, no. no we can, I'm we not can... wrapping up. I was just trying to wrap up for you. It doesn't sound like you give the Agora thing, first of all, any credence uh, as, a, as an objective scientific thing. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, even we, we can go any back to that. credence yeah. as a metaphor. No, absolutely. It feels like I'm, you think I'm, it is teleological and self-centered. No, no, no. And made yeah, up. And- no, so let me clarify. Yeah. Uh, again, the weak versus strong anthropic principle. I, I think it's more like the weak anthropic. It's more like a metaphor. If it is literal, uh, again, it depends on the language. I mean, I think uh, I agree with you. Consciousness is real. It exists. But are do you think after you die and your brain is dead, the neurons are you know, oxygen deprived in however many minutes or hours, where does your mind go, do you think? Or how would you I answer don't that? Know. You don't know. Yeah. My answer I mean, to the question is it doesn't go anywhere because mm. it, it, it's a process. It's not a thing. We've reified mm. the word into existing. Like where does your heartbeat go when your heart when you're dead? It mm. doesn't go anywhere. It, it, the, the organ stops functioning. The mind was a function of the brain. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, mind That's and consciousness, theory. sentience, it's real. It's an emergent property mm-hmm. of neurons firing in sequence or whatever the ex- explanation is going to ultimately be. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, if, uh, I, I will challenge, I mean, you made several assertions in that that I'm not sure I agree with. You know, when I ask you something, when I, when I give you a math problem, uh, do this in your head, 55 times 20, and you figure it out, where does it feel like, where does it, the, 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 the feeling of thought, where does that occur? It occurs in your brain, right? Mm-hmm. In your head. Or when I ask you to recall something, and you put that in your head as your brain, do you realize that is not a biological feeling you have, that that is a societal feeling? And the reason we know this is that that's a brand new idea, that that that, that thought is happening in your brain. You learn things by heart. And so... Uh, Galen and Aristotle and all those folks thought memory was stored in the heart. So when mm-hmm. they did math, they felt it in the heart, just mm-hmm. like you just felt it in your head. Mm-hmm. And others put it in the liver, which is a very central organ. And that's mm-hmm. why you know something in your gut. So when you think you feel it in your head, when you think you feel yourself in your head, uh, that's not true. You don't really feel it there. You've just convinced yourself of that. So now, why do you think it exists there? If, if you accept that hypothesis that it's not, that's just a societal belief you have. Why do you, now why do you think it comes from the brain? Why doesn't it, for instance, an emergent property of your whole body, as opposed to just the brain, why do you just put it in the brain? 1,100. What? 
Oh yeah, five fifty times twenty. Exactly. <laughs> well, you okay. You know the intuitive feelings people have in the past about where consciousness or the mind exists. That's interesting. Historically, we know it's the brain. We know absolutely one hundred percent because strokes, damage, t you know, open brain surgery, the split brain experiments. You know, touching the electrodes in the temporal lobe generates this. The fusiform mm -hmm. gyrus area of the temporal lobe that is associated with facial recognition if it has damage, people get face blindness and so on. You know, when, when you take I will dispute a, when, all of that. I will dispute all of that. So you're saying things I assume most of the listeners would know. The the disputation of it though is that there's cellular memory. We don't know that we don't store memories uh, in cells in DNA. Well, that, I'll ask you what I asked Deepak Chopra, who's a mm -hmm. consciousness first person. No, no, and again, where, I'm just talking about biological fact. I'm not talking about anything touchy-feely well, here. Well, uh, that's okay, yeah. Where does Aunt Millie's mind go when it dies of Alzheimer's? Well, the, where is it now? You you are very confident it's in her brain, yeah. and not in her body. Absolutely. Not in her body. What do you think? I mean, I covered this in the Agora book. What do you think about, um, they're, they're not conclusive. I'm not going to push this really far. But the uh, occurrences of like um, organ transplantees who adopt, yeah, uh, I'm aware of that. First of all, yeah. not not everybody does. In fact, most don't. Correct. Not a majority. Okay. Could it possibly be there is some cellular memory that exists systemically, and it's not all in your brain? So Maybe. now all of a sudden, uh, I, I okay, say, great. So yeah. now we're in agreement but not that the likely. mind, not the mind is not necessarily so <laughs> okay. in the brain. All right. So you know, there's like the it. gut. There's the gut neurons and all that stuff. Yes. Okay. So yeah. it's an integrated. Yeah, there's an integrated many system. neurons in your gut as a rat has in its brain. So but your we gut know, is as smart as a rat. We, we know, for example, when Alzheimer's patients are going, you mm -hmm. know, we know exactly what's going on in the brain. The plaques entangles. The neurons mm -hmm. are shrinking and dying, and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's what happens when you get, you know, a, a, a stroke we to the know, Broca's area, and you can't uh -huh. interpret speech anymore. We do know that that your ability to access all the other stuff is impaired dramatically. That's what we know. All I'm saying is you say all these things so confidently, mm -hmm. like like these are um, beyond dispute. Well, so again, what's more likely that, uh -huh. you know, all the convergence of evidence from uh, a century of neuroscience research and experiments showing that the mind is what the brain does. It's a, it's a process mm -hmm. versus what's the alternatives? You know, where is consciousness without the brain? distributed through the body that's why it's in your gut and that's why you know you get heartbroken okay I, all right i will go with you to the point where it's not just a brain you can't have a brain in the bat that mm -hmm. we are our entire body so for example to achieve immortality you, you can't just you know cut off your head and you have it chronically frozen or uploaded to the cloud that's not going to do it you know that here to me the self back to the self it is not just your memories. It's not your, your your mem self, memory self. It's your point of view self. It's it's the moment to moment to moment uh, of experience through your eyes. Sleep breaks the cycle for a few hours. Anesthesia does it a little more dramatically, but it comes back. Uh, when you're dead, it doesn't go anywhere. The self just stops. So if in the brain scan scenario where we c scan your connectome and upload all your memories that are presumably stored in these synaptic connections um, and put it in a digital file. None of this is possible at the moment, but just say it could be. Um, but let's say we did that to you uh, while you're alive. We slid you into a super sophisticated fMRI brain scanner, scanned your connect and upload it to the cloud, turn it on and go, look, Byron's up there and, and then slide you back out. And you're standing there going, no, I'm, I'm right here. I'm looking through my eyes, experiencing myself here. That's just a copy. We're in ship of Theseus land. Yeah. Yeah. So I, unless you want to define the self as more than one you, 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 there's multiple yous, something like that. And now we're in philosophical land here, science fiction uh, land. Uh, well, yeah. I think if, if, if these examples are pushed to absurdity, then you could argue that our if pushed to absurd, if pushed to an extreme, it becomes absurd. Then one can reasonably say perhaps our assumptions are wrong. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just far less confident that we have it all figured out than than you do. Um, I guess I guess that's it. You have because a lot of confidence on these matters. Uh, well, that only I, don't have. I mean, I only have confidence of what 
neuroscientists tell me that they've mm-hmm. found so far, mm-hmm. admitting that there's still a lot of unknowns. I mean, we know a lot about memory, but not not completely. I mean, there's a lot of unexplained things there, but still, you, you know, you take the neurons away through strokes or damage or uh, or uh, dementia uh, diseases, and it, it, the, the memories are gone. They don't go anywhere. Uh, if they did, why can't Aunt Millie get her memories back? You know, if we ha- if they're distributed through the body, well, then don't worry about the brain. Let's find some drug that turns the memories back on in your liver, wherever you think they might be stored, or they're stored holistically. You know, all right, what, what, what can we get some technology to bring those memories back? So far, no. Yeah, and here we are, what, in 6,000 years into trying. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. Now, it could be that it's just another 6,000 years and we'll have it. It could be that we're on the wrong path completely and, and we just need a, another Einstein to come along and go, you know, you've completely uh, thought about the problem the wrong way. Here's how we're going to think. Oh, okay. And that makes sense. But I, if I knew that, I'd, <laughs> I'd write about it, but I don't. No, nobody does at the moment. But you do. Agora. All right. G- tell us how Agora can answer these questions. Or whatever I, I was you want being to do. a little bit facetious. I know, I know, I know. I, know. Um, <laughs> I believe, though, that um, that uh, you know, I start with what is life, and why is a cell a lie? Because a cell doesn't have any living parts, and so you say, what makes the cell alive? And the cell appears to be a bag of chemicals, uh, of inorganic things. It's a bag of rocks that just happen to like do their thing, and that. Um, that that, that 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 is still a question. We don't know why the cell is alive. Yeah, Dawkins has a nice analogy about this. That it's like looking at a locomotive and asking, you know, it, it, does it have a locomotive, like a, 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 a mm. Elon locomotive, like the Elon spirit, the esprit esprit mm. Elon, right? Mm. It has this some mystical force that you know it it, it it animates it. Of course, nobody thinks that now. It's just a process. Life is a but process a of chemical s- processes, and mm-hmm. and I don't want to get to the point where we go. Well, at some point, then a miracle happens, and all of a sudden the lights come on, and, and something is alive. It it just mm-hmm. has to be a bottom up emergent property of mm-hmm. just chemicals doing stuff in a way that even if we don't fully understand it, life things become alive, and then they're no longer right. alive. They're dead. But you see how dogmatic you are, because my my beginning statement was, we don't know. And you said, ergo, you're asserting that it's a mystical force, and it has to be this. Those were your exact words. It has to be this. But that's dogma. It doesn't have to be that. I'm not asserting it's anything mystical. I'm just saying, can we not just approach it and say, we don't know? We don't know. There's still something. Oh, certainly. That, that's yeah, a uh, okay. absolutely. Of course. But fair yeah. enough. So somehow their cells are alive. And, and we don't know, but somehow we know that cells come together and they form ever more complex things. And they do that because they get new capabilities when they do it. And they do it through specialization and energy and all that. And that those things come together and form more complexity. And those things form more complexity, more complexity, more complexity. And, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's the end of the story. But I don't think it is because do I think, think... Do you think the internet could become your agora, a, a, a sentient being itself? Well... I do not, but there. You don't. Kevin Kelly, oh, that surprises me. Yeah, Kevin no, no, Kelly. No, I think right. it's uniquely human. I mm. mean, I I believe humans come together. They specialize in ten thousand jobs, which are analogous to cells. They cannot survive apart from it. Like I don't think it has anything to do with it. Kevin Kelly has a superorganism he calls the Technium, which is mm-hmm. all this technology coming together, and and those aren't at odds. The idea that there are different levels of order that achieve different emergent things actually is quite beautiful to me. I love um, Kevin Kelly. He's, yeah, he's a friend, uh, but brilliant. you know, what, what does technology want? <laughs> I mean, it's a fun way to ask the question, but it, you know, it, but this want, you know, it's like, what does AI want? AI, you know, this AI is an existential threat. It, it wants to conquer. It doesn't want anything. Does your car want to burn premium? Like, is it not a nonsense? <laughs> no, it doesn't statement? want anything. It's, you know, it's just, yeah. yeah, it depends what you mean by that word. Right. right. I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, you know, but I just—it's hard for me to picture what. You know. I think I think you have so, like you you hear these words. It seems to me, and they suggest to you a set of beliefs behind them that you that you abhor. Um, well, abhor. They, they, it's they, not they that might, abhor. Be, it's, they it's, might it's... be just being used as a convenience. 
Well, I'll, I'll make an analogy. So people that uh, are libertarian free will people, mm-hmm. not not the political thing. But, I understand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that there's something like a little mini me inside me. You know, that to me, it seems like a mystical thing. Like there's some mm-hmm. homunculus in there floating around like the mind is it's reified. That's why I'm a compatibilist, not a free willist in that sense. You know, we, we live in a determined mechanical universe, but out of here, you like that part, the emergent property of complex systems um, in which we have goals and we can be aware of the past and the future is never exactly the same. So this could you have done different? Absolutely, you could do, do different because the future is never going to be like the past. You can't step into the same river twice because it's a different river and you're a different person. And you can learn from the past so you can self-determine, determine your own future by making decisions along the way based on what happened in the past. So you can still have determinism. Anyway, this is my version of compatibilism. Yes. But I, but, but I, I mean, think that the people that think that there's a free will, like a homunculus, that's a mystical idea. Mm-hmm. You know, the best support for what you're saying is this little bit of research that's been done that says you develop your narrative of why you did things after you do them. That's true. And yeah. and what's beautiful about that is that your brain has all these specialized parts and they all occupy, they all function autonomously. And that the you is some part of your brain, it's not a homunculi, but it's some process in your brain that is trying to make sense of them and integrate them. And so it's constantly making this retroactive narrative explaining why it did it. Like it's in charge. I, I told it to do that. That was my idea. Oh, that was my idea too. I decided <laughs> yeah. that. And that that is what you hear in that voice in your head. It's, it's yeah. a mental process. I think that's right. That's Michael mm-hmm. Gazaniga's, you know, na- uh, left hemisphere narr- narr- narrator. I, I think that's true. A- absolutely. Do you know uh, Jason Jane's the bicameral mind stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that from long ago. Yeah. <laughs> That, you know, this idea that we weren't conscious 3,000 yeah, years ago. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I most people, I, I will say up front, it is not, shall we say, widely accepted. Yeah. But it yeah. is incredibly provocative uh, that, that what the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, this part is true, the ancient Greeks, 400 BC-ish, had a sense that about 700 years earlier, the age of the heroes, say 1100 BC, that the gods walked among them and mm-hmm. that they don't anymore. And they mm-hmm. wondered why. And what Jane says is that the part of the brain was saying something to the other part that it was mm-hmm. interpreting as the voice of God. Yeah. And that that fused and we became conscious and then the voice went away. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> no, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying it's a provocative idea. I know. I know. I understand. Idea. I don't yeah. uh, ex- I believe it either. Um, but it's really, anyway. Yeah. Well, these are hard problems. Um, and again, I guess what ideas I'm toying with is. Are they soluble, but they're just really hard problems to solve? And we just need another half century or century or the next Einstein or whoever to come along to fix it? Or are we down the wrong pathway? We're asking the wrong questions. I would like to tell you what the conclusion of my book is. Please. Because I would like to tell you the conclusion of my book. Because I do think, I don't really care in a way. So, um, do you remember, do you remember the 1972 uh, plane crash in the Andes with the rugby yep. players? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I liked your story in the book too. It was nice. Yeah. Time. Okay. So uh, I'll jump to the end and end part of that. So I tell another story in the book about this guy in 1947 who committed suicide. Uh, by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was a, 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 a psychologist at Stanford, Dr. Jerome Motto, who studied suicide. He goes up to San Francisco to check this out. He goes to the guy's apartment who had committed suicide. A single guy, lived alone, nothing wrong with him. But he had left a suicide note. And the suicide note said, um, I'm going to walk to the bridge now. If one person smiles at me along the way, I will not jump. And so we can assume nobody smiled at him. And what I take away from superorganisms is that we think, we think, I think, most people think, that the future of humanity hinges on a few of the power people who do everything, and we are just sort of along for the ride, and we don't really have any say in it. And what I have learned with superorganisms is that is 100% not true. That just like that clock, that watch I gave you, the biggest gear in it isn't the one keeping time. It's, it takes all of the gears. And the superorganism works because all of the individual parts just do their thing. 
And so what the book concludes with is if you've ever feel like you're not doing enough or you don't know what you're supposed to be doing with your life and all of that, uh, that you should move past that because nobody can comprehend the whole and that put no bigger burden on yourself than to be kind to other people and every day try to just be a little bit, a little bit nicer than you were yesterday, a little bit better of a person. Aldous Huxley at the end of his life said after 40 years of study, I'm embarrassed to say that all the, I have come to, the only conclusion I've come to is we should all try to be kinder to each other. And I don't think he should be embarrassed to say that. If you adopt the superorganism thing, then what it says to you is just be a good bee. And whatever that means, whatever your algorithms are, whatever your part of the hive is, do it and just help the other bees. And an agora can do anything. Agora can build a smartphone. Agora can deflect an asteroid. Agora can do anything, but it relies on people. Um, not no beehive works where half the bees are against the other half. <laughs> and, and, and so what I tried to do with yeah. my book, the last thing I'll say is there's this thing called the overview effect where people go into space and they see the whole earth and they go, wow, we're all just one people. And they come back changed and we cannot send everybody through space to, to do that. And so I've tried to create the overview effect in this book to say, you can perceive all of humanity as a thing and you don't have the, the left hand does not have to like the left, the right hand, but it has to understand they're the same animal and they live and die together. And that's what I wrote the book for. I mm -hmm. wrote it. Well, I won't say that anyway. Oh, no, go ahead. I started writing it the day my father went into a nursing home mm. and I finished it six months later on the day he died. Oh gosh. And he did not go gentle into the night. He raged against the dying of the light. And all of that was in my head while I produced this book. And all, all of this, this humanity that I was like grappling with and thinking about and, and trying to understand, trying to comprehend it. You know, he had 83 amazing years and six terrible months. And, uh, and I wrote that during the six terrible months that, that uh, you know, I, I shared with him as much as I could. And I was writing this book. And this book is about uh, humanity, about our common humanity. And that's why I like it. Like, I would think a humanist would embrace it. because Oh, it I is totally a, love all that. Every, everything. Yeah. yeah, we're just having a conversation about technical things. I agree with your um, your, your final conclusions. I, I use Kevin Kelly's descriptor of protopia. Don't aim for utopia, mm -hmm. which is unattainable. And certainly don't go for dystopia because that's no fun. But protopia, just make tomorrow slightly better than today. Incremental, tiny little steps. No rush, three, four, three steps forward, two back, whatever, this is life. Uh, but each of us cumulatively can make a difference, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole basis of democracy, right? I mean, we all have a, a voice and, you know, what the right structure for that is, is debatable. But um, but that idea has been developing for centuries and you know, there's more democracies now. Well, maybe there's a few less than a few years ago, but overall, there's more than, than ever in history mm -hmm. because that's what people want. They want to have their little voice. Even if you tell me about your vote, vote doesn't count in California because they're going to go damn no matter what. Well, come on. I still want to, I still want to pull the tab and, and then punch the button or whatever. So I feel like I'm, I'm making a difference, but more lar uh, largely, even if, um, it looks like probably most of what you do doesn't really matter. Whether I go left or right in the supermarket probably doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but you don't know that. You know, I don't know that, you know, the person I meet and I say a, a, a nice thing or I smile at them and they don't jump. Right. I mean, it's probably not the case, but you never know. You don't know. So why not smile uh, just in case? So I, I'm 100 percent on board with you uh, uh, for sure. Good place to stop. All right, Byron. Thanks for your work. What are you working on next? Another book. Yeah, but I haven't announced it. I find that if I talk about them, it jinxes it. <laughs> no, it doesn't jinx it. I lose my enthusiasm for it really? because I get I get tired of it. I oh, get tired I see. Of it. You talk about it too much, right? I right. get tired of it, and, yeah. and I, so I have to I have to hold the specialness of it. I will say I write books about things I do not know much about. Mm. Um, that is true, and all of my books read, I think like two people at lunch together telling each other what they're excited about because my books are all about uh, things, I, I, my journeys. So it will be about something completely different than anything I've ever written. About. Okay. All right. Well, I enjoyed this conversation. We covered, I don't I know, most of the biggest questions in all of yeah. life. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Not all right. chocolate or vanilla or <laughs> Christmas right, not, Eve or Christmas right, Day. You right. know, we didn't do that one. But the other one. All, all right, right Byron, well, thank you. Let's do it again. Thank you for having me on the show.